let's have a conversation about design. This incredibly transformational tool that we can all use. But if we're going to, we have to also face this unseen enemy that's in all of us. It can blind us to some of our greatest ideas, but it can affect even how we receive them, work together to achieve them. And so let's start here. 1511, this is the School of Athens painted by Raphael. And this is a living time capsule of one of our most innovative eras in human history. But more importantly, it represents a transformation from the previous medieval period. And there are three things that we can apply to our transformational era. Number one, the intellectual technology enhanced. What we see here for the first time, art got better. You see that in perspective. You see that in realism. And you see this now passed on and tools increased and enhanced in their sophistication. We also see that the role of the designer or the artist changed. This perception changed. In the medieval period, artists were craftsmen, just like a mason or a blacksmith. And in the Renaissance, we see this new notion of multi-talentism. This idea of this classic archetype of the Renaissance man where artists were now inventors, architects, engineers. And lastly, we see the culture itself, this new approach, this reverence for science, for systems, for language, and at the center, humanism. And those of you may be familiar with some of the design terms today, the tools we use, not just as a hands-on aesthetic approach, but from the business tool of design thinking or human-centered design. This is what is happening today, and this is why this is such a powerful tool for innovation. And innovation is important to us. In fact, we actually write this word in the English language more than we have in the last two centuries. And it's important to note that while this intellectual technology of design, this universal language of aesthetic that's broadened, one technology helps another. So in 1936, we see the first concept of the modern computer. In 1974, the first workstation. So design is a tool that is on the rise, and it's a tool for all of us to access, all of us to take advantage of. And it's for anyone who wants to take one situation and make it to a preferred situation. So if we're going to quote Herb Simon, a Nobel laureate in economics, let's look at the marketplace. Right now, you might expect the social or technology sector to be incorporating design in a really meaningful way. But we also see this happening in atypical behavior in some of these other sectors, product, service, and engineering, banking and finance, business management. All of these represent billions of dollars of market capital, and they're acquiring companies, not just founded by designers who have a new take or, or look at the world, but actually the service companies themselves and incorporating them into their own business models. Once more, we see these new roles. They're changing right before our eyes. We see chief creative officer, chief design officer, chief experience officer at some of the most popular and well-known brands in the marketplace. So now that's anecdotal and kind of convincing that there's a rise, but let's look at it another way, maybe something a little bit more concrete. Um, design Management Institute and Motive, they put together a design index. The criteria spit these companies out, and when compared to the S&P, outperformed 228% in the last 10 years. We also see this happening in your government. So after, quite frankly, the debacle of launching healthcare.gov, 18F was an announced in March 19, uh, 2014. 18F would resemble a company just like the one I work for, and, and as an invention company, a design and technology, doing the same kind of type of work inside your government. And their mission here isn't to add more information or more technology. It's to simplify the government's digital services. That's an act of design. It's in your education as well. Stanford University is putting $35 million into creating the D School. This is founded by David Kelly, the chairman of IDEO. 
who popularized the business tool, design thinking. When we step back and we look at that accumulation, we can apply that against our different economies, from manufacturing to service, or information to design, we see why it's so important today. It can't be, or it's not enough to just be reliable. It has to be usable, convenient, and the hardest thing is to be personally significant. And this is where the tool of design can take place. So now let's face this, this enemy. What is this thing? Well, there is a, a, a focused group when you have to create something. And it starts with an idea. It starts with working with a group. And when you're challenged to do that, there's always this uncomfortability. We know that. In fact, I can tell you at the age of six, I wanted to go into this kind of career. And at 18, yet, I had a huge pause. Should I go to art and design school or not? Now, why was that there? Why was that hesitation to go? Because I knew this would be a path that others did not take. When we think about that, I came across a definition by this artist, Sting. When he was interviewed, he was asked, what's your definition of creativity? And he said, you have to be able to risk ridicule, to be pilliard. And I stopped because I had no idea what pilliard meant. This is a pillar. To be publicly put out for shame, for torture, for ridicule. Now imagine an artist who has produced decades of creativity could still use such vulnerable language. So it's not enough for us to have the intellectual technologies and all these tools of how we can use design. We have to have an emotional IQ as well. So what is this enemy, this unseen enemy that's in you, it's in me, it's in all of us? It's called the bias against creativity. And it's a psychological phenomenon. And it happens not just in the creation of work, which we are very commonly here that that anxiety that comes with sharing an idea, but it's actually how we receive them, how we collaborate, how we recognize them. Because creativity is core, but design is a process. Design is the rigor of creativity. And we have to take it through a number of different steps, whether it be research or strategy or asking difficult questions that we may not be very comfortable with the answers, diving deep into what a user might tell us, and developing the systems that would follow. Now, why does this happen? Well, when we come up with an idea, let's say, for example, I would love to share this information with you today. I'm on A. That's great. But what we tend to do is we suddenly want to skip to Z. We con constantly want to see what the end product is. And we celebrate the aftermath of all that has come before us. But what happens in between is the real work. And this is where that psychological phenomenon is something we want to scratch away. It impedes us. It's all of these feelings of uncertainty. It could be the step that you're taking that you think is worthless. It might be the exploration of an idea that goes nowhere but could lead to something else. It's that experimentation that has to take place. And why this is so important? Because creating anything wonderful, it takes people. It takes understanding how I can connect with you and how your ideas can be connecting with me. So this, this phenomenon, the psychology, or this, this bias against creativity, it's been covered in some of our most prestigious psychology magazines and journals. We can see this in the classroom. For example, when you ask teachers, do you foster, do you cultivate a, a creative classroom? Is it important to you? They would say, yes, they do. But when you look at the personality traits that are associated with, quote unquote, a creative personality, you see they tend to rank those students as the least favorite. See, at, at our firm, we said, we will ban the idea of having a creative department. We will not tell someone who walks through our door that there is a have and have not. We ask everyone to be creative. We would never create that immediate bias, which not only puts one person in the box that says, you can come up with ideas and you cannot. This other person now suddenly says, you can only come up with ideas here, but you do not have this idea of being multi-talented. So it's important to think about how it incorporates in your culture and your behavior. We can see this in the, the corporate war room, right? We, we hear each other say, we want to think differently. 
We need these new, fresh ideas. Yet, what we tend to see is only if we all agree. As human beings, we hate learning curves, and we have to have a sanctioned agreement. So we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to cultivate something new? We can also see this in the boardroom. And this was, this was really troubling to see, but you can see this in evidence of when we are electing our leaders or interviewing our candidates or seeing where they can have an effect on the vision that we need for our organizations. We need visionary leaders, we say, yet only if they keep their ideas to themselves. So we see that what happens, and I think all of you might have experienced this at one time or another, that sharing ideas can sometimes be detrimental. And that's what this study found, that oftentimes, unless you have this extra charisma gene, that your ideas and sharing those could impede your advancement in your corporation or even getting that particular job. So this bias against creativity in the light of the rise of design as a tool that now has more access to all of us can be applied through business, through the, the design act itself, whether it be the aesthetic or the strategy. Is this bad or good? Well, what it is is human, and it's just there. It's inside of all of us. So my goal for you today is to have a relationship with it to identify that, to understand that. Because design will help us be more transformational. We can't just use those three principles of these sophisticated tools helping us, this new idea of roles changing, and this culture. We have to have a better relationship with the process of design, the tools of design, and the people we design with. Good luck and thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Trevor Anowitz. Now, Ted requests that we share.